Hey friends, Troy Spillman here. This week, in our Bible reading plan, we are going through the middle section of the book of Ecclesiastes, covering chapters 3 through 9. The idea is that you would find times to read these daily Bible passages as a family. Carve out time for you and your family and friends to engage in some questions that we will have for you at the end of this video. We know that Solomon wrote three books. Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, as an old man, he reflects back on his life and wrestles with the seasons that he describes as being confusing and meaningless to him. His later years were marked by backsliding and his turning away from God. It's in this season of life that he writes this book. In the first two chapters of this book, Solomon laments about the emptiness of life, apart from a life lived for the Lord. Then he transitions to chapter 3. Chapter 3 starts off with a well-known passage that has a poetic feel to it. It's based on the theme, there's a time for everything. And it takes us through some of the highs and lows of life. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the sun, is what it says. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And it goes on and on. The way that these first eight verses are put together draws attention just to this monotony of life apart from having the Lord direct our steps. Then there's one of the more striking verses, not just in this book, but in the entire Bible. Verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. So the idea here is that God has placed within each of us a consciousness of eternity. As a young man, I often questioned the existence of God. But after I considered the amazing design of our universe, our world, even of the human body, it became more and more clear to me that there had to be a designer to it all. And if there is a designer, then there has to be a purpose for it to exist in the first place. And that means I have a purpose. You have a purpose. And we will see that with each chapter we cover, it's as if Solomon is flipping through the chapters of life reflecting upon the lessons learned, and many of these lessons were learned the hard way. I think most of us can relate to some of these hard-earned nuggets of wisdom that he has for us. So, starting in chapter 4, we'll see that the word vanity being used a lot, which simply means emptiness, is actually used 37 times throughout this book. In the midst of this vanity, or emptiness, he focuses a few bright spots as he surveys his life. And one of those bright spots are the close relationships he has forged over the years. He writes, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. So Solomon here, he knew that no one is supposed to be an island. We need others in our lives. We need the help of others, and we'll be a help to them sometime as well. And then in chapters 5 and 6, he weaves in the theme of the vanity or the emptiness of striving to gain honor and wealth. This is where we get the well-known sentiment, we brought nothing into this world and we'll bring nothing out. And he goes on with this thought and writes, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. So like a mirage out in the desert, having wealth and riches look so enticing, but they can't satisfy. So through some hard learned lessons, he encourages us to be content with what we have. And it's good for us to remember that this is spoken by one of the richest men of all time. How tragic is a life that lives only for the temporal, the material things this world has to offer. 
and how full and rich is the life that lived for Christ. For the believer, at the end of the road of this life is a beginning of internal inheritance for the saints of God. We have so much more to look forward to. Then in chapters 7, 8, and 9, Solomon speaks of the value of practical wisdom. He just walks us through some scenarios of life. One of them is, a good name is better than fine perfume. And the day of death, better than the day of birth. The idea is that there is great value in a good name. It's something that can't be bought. And once it's lost, it is really difficult to regain. That is some good wisdom for us to hold on to. Another one is, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. So we can have like a skewed view of the past and we be prone to lament the good old days instead of embracing what the Lord has for us here and now. Then Solomon goes on to express grief over the fact that bad things happen to good people. We all wrestle with this from time to time. Yet we know that on this side of eternity, we don't fully understand the work that God is doing through the trials and challenges that come our way. For many of us, it's the challenging times that brought us to the place of trust in Jesus. I know that was my case. So often the Lord refines us and molds us into the people he wants us to be in the midst of the difficult times. This reminds me of Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And as you go through these chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes, here are a few questions to consider. One, how can you practically redeem the monotony of life, especially those times when we feel as if we're just going through the motions? Two, how have you witnessed the truth that God has set eternity in the human heart? Three, Solomon points out the value of close relationships. What are some practical ways you have benefited from the relationships in your life? How can you further cultivate those relationships? And finally, four, Solomon laments that bad things happen to good people. But how does the truth from Romans 8, 28 give us a wider perspective? So friends, press on in these daily Bible readings and be on the lookout for the spiritual nuggets that can be gleaned from these chapters for this week in the book of Ecclesiastes, praying that these are rich and fruitful times for you.